WOW is a gigantic undertaking uh, for so many people on the team. And so getting a chance to talk to you guys a little bit about how the behind the scenes of that works is, uh, is really cool. So I'm really excited about it. So first off, um, who am I? Uh, like I'm Corey Stockton. I'm the lead content designer on WOW. I've been at Blizzard a little over six years now. I started there uh, right when we were working on WOW, right, right before WOW shipped. Um, other than that, I've been working, I worked at two other places before that, Insomniac Games on the Ratchet and Clank series. And before that, I worked at a place called Crystal Dynamics on the Soul Reaver franchise. So let's get into it. So what is macro design? Um, what is that concept? What exactly does that mean? Uh, Basically, the idea is that we're thinking about the game as a whole. Uh, it's really easy to get lost in the details of something and, uh, and get caught up in that one specific thing instead of seeing everything on the game and everything that you're working on. So what macro design is, is a chance to focus in on those individual things and make sure that, you know, that things are progressing in the way that you want, even though one part of the game might be working out really well, um, another thing might get left behind. So the idea is being able to focus on things as a whole. Um, the part about doing macro design is that a lot of it is selling to other people on the team. Um, so if someone wants to pitch an idea, a lot of times the way we do that is we'll, you know, we'll come up with a, an idea and you'll have to sell that idea to other people. That's the same concept. So the things that we're doing here, we want to, to look good and be presentable, but we also don't want you to spend so much time on them that you think that you're wasting, you know, that it's something that an artist would do. Uh, this is definitely the stuff I'm going to be showing you here, our designer looking things that have been done in a variety of programs, but basically flow charts, uh, spreadsheets, uh, a lot of 2D layouts that are done in Illustrator. Um, you want to be able to sell things to other people. It's a huge part of this. Uh, scale is the final thing that really has a huge part in this, and that idea being that what you're pitching has got to fit into the scope of the game that you're making. Everyone wants to make the biggest level or the biggest thing, but you have to think about how does that fit into the scope of the game? Is it relative? Does it make sense? Um, so we're going to put all those things together and talk about it a little bit. Uh, why is this important? Mainly, you're going to try to cut off the mistakes early. If you can do as many things as you can do on paper, um, looking at the game as a whole, you're going to save time later because you might have made, a, you could make too many of something and then end up not using it. You might make something that's not going to end up working in the long run because you didn't spend time up front thinking about it and making sure that it's going to work. Um, so much of this stuff is done on paper. Um, just taking the ideas, getting it down, looking at it, and making sure that it makes sense before you commit assets to it. That's the biggest thing that you're going to find is on your team, those assets are really important and you want to spend them as well as you can from your artists, your programmers, everyone else outside of the design team. Uh, as I said, communicating these ideas to other people, hugely important. You can have the greatest idea, but if you can't sell it to everyone else on the team, it's not really worth having because no one's even going to know about it. So, um, so what I've done, I've broken the talk into kind of four separate sections about different ways that we use macro design, specifically on WOW. Um, we've got a lot of examples of different things, and so we're going to kick it off here with layouts. Um, now, there's different programs that people can use for this stuff. Um, at Blizzard, we tend to use uh, Adobe Illustrator as our main program that we use to do all the layouts for everything in the game. Um, personally, I've been using Illustrator for probably 14, 15 years now at this point, so I, it's a program that I feel I know really well. Um, but you know, there's obviously other things people can use. You can choose to use Photoshop. Uh, you know, some people uh, want to do things in 3D rather than working in 2D first. I highly recommend working in 2D before you go into 3D. Um, it might seem easy that you can block things out really quick in 3D, but you'll find that it's really hard to then sell those ideas to other people. You can't put them on a wiki. You can't put them in a, a PowerPoint presentation and talk about them. Uh, it, there's just things that you don't think about up front that'll come back and nail you later. Um, Illustrator is a great tool because uh, it allows you to export things to PDF. It's got layers like Photoshop, so you can do things like grids and keep your sense of scale really quick and easy. Big, best thing about it overall, though, is that it's vector. So everything in Illustrator is vector art, so it's super scalable. So you can take it to different places, different formats, and you're not going to lose anything that you've put into it. Um, so as far as WoW goes, um, I'm going to use some examples from across um, all the expansions. Um, what you're seeing here is a, a layout for Old Doom. This is one of the new zones that we shipped with Cataclysm. Um, doing the layout is the first step. Um, it comes after the brainstorm meetings. We decide what we want the zone to be, how we're going to get into it, what the story is that's going to happen there. But once we kind of get through that first initial jam sessions on the zone, we get into the phase of actually 
figuring out how big it's going to be, what's going to make it unique, what's going to make it interesting. Um, here's another example. This is Kazan, which is our new goblin start area. Um, See, the thing about these layouts is you want them to be clean, you want them to be simple, but you also want to have detail that people want to see. Um, you want to make sure that you're not spending too much time on it that, like I said, it turns into something that an artist should do, but it should be something that's presentable and, and clean. It's going to make people, when you're pitching your idea to someone, it's so much easier if, they, if it's likable right off the bat. A lot of designers overlook this thing and they think that it's okay to do things that might not really have that that kind of artistic vibe to it, but something like that really will go a long way when you're trying to sell your idea. Um, there's call outs on these. Um, here's a third one. This is Firelands Raid. This is a, uh, we haven't even shipped this yet, actually. This is going to be in the 4.1 patch that we're actually working on right now, Cataclysm's first uh, big patch. So those first two you saw were outdoor zones. This is an actual uh, a dungeon, what we would call a raid on World of Warcraft. Um, and so we kind of use layouts for everything across the board. It's not just for an individual part of the game. We kind of do this for everything. Um, just helps us get our, you know, our feet in the ground and get us going. Uh, Illustrator is super easy to update. You can get something out, give it to other people, um, resave off another file really quick and get updates um, for that stuff. We put all of our stuff on an internal wiki is what we use. Um, and then everyone on the design team and the art team and stuff all has access to the wiki so they can see updated stuff whenever they want. So here's another layout here. This is uh, Gilneas, which is where the, uh, the new race, Worgen, started for Cataclysm. Um, you can see here there's an overlay over it. That's our world grid. And the world grid is there basically to give us our sense of scale. We have a world grid that works for all of WoW across the board. We call them world chunks is what they are. Um, and we're able to translate that scale directly into Illustrator. So inside of Illustrator, you can set up grids any way you want. We've set up the grids to exactly match our world scale that we use. Um, it's super important because we can see how much we're biting off early. So you could design the coolest zone in the world, but if it's so big that the artists don't have time to make it, it's, it's of no use to you. So thinking about scale and these kind of things really early is something that's really going to take you a long way. So this is a, something we use internally. Uh, I mentioned world chunks earlier. So this is a look at what a zone like Old Doom looks like with our world chunk grid laid over it. Um, world chunks is kind of how we describe how uh, an area in WoW would be, would be seen. So the way that we work on our game is we have the whole game uh, kind of laid out in a map and we can open individual world chunks one part at a time and work on them. So WoW is a giant game, right? There's all these zones and everything's interconnected. There's no loading. You can just go from zone to zone. So what we do is we open up an individual world chunk and then we work on that area one at a time. So for us, it's just a great sense of measurement. We can say that, well, this zone's going to be 20 world chunks. This zone's going to be 30 world chunks. And we can kind of know right off the bat how many um, level designers we're going to need on it, how many texture guys, um, how many buildings we're going to need to make it feel right. So this is just a way for us to see that stuff in the game. Um, but things like this can be applied to any game. Obviously, it's not just WoW. All games have a sense of scale. Um, when we were working on Ratchet and Clank, we had the exact same kind of thing, but we, we had a different unit of scale that we used. But everything that we did followed that same unit of scale, and you can get uniformity across all your different levels. You don't necessarily want one level to be super long and the next level in the game is super short and then you go back to another long level. Sometimes that's okay, but in general, you want to have a general flow across the game and using a, a sense of scale early on will really help that. Our producers love this on the team because it gives them a chance to see you know, how much, the producers always think the designers are crazy because we're trying to do so much stuff. So it's a great way to also sell what we're doing. We can actually finish in the amount of time that we think we can finish it in. So this is uh, verifying that that data is correct. That's what you're seeing here. So this is a look at Tol Barad, which was um, an island that's part of Cataclysm. It's our PvP daily area, so players can go here and do daily quests. Um, so that picture there is what we would call a map stitch. So with, within the game, we basically have a utility that allows us to render out top-down 2D maps. Imagine uh, just like when you go to Google Maps and you turn on the satellite imagery and you can see exactly what's there. We have a tool at Blizzard that we have to do that same thing for WoW. So here I've rendered out this top-down little look at a uh, Tolbarad. And then I can take the in-game Illustrator map, which is here that I had done, I don't know, months before any of this was ever built, um, and compare the two and make sure that the reference is the same. Because a lot of times things are going to get lost in translation. It's something that happens on game design and game production all the time, right? You could hand off a level 
And then when you get back into that level, you look at it later, it could be larger, it could be smaller. The scale might not be right. And uh, scale and things like that are so key to the design that you originally intend to have. If you want that to be in the final product, you really got to follow through and make sure that that's there the whole time. Um, so this picture is an overlay. So you can see we've just basically taken the map stitch, laid the Illustrator map over the top of it, and made sure that what we got in the end from the level designers was exactly what we intended when we designed the level up front. So it's a great way to kind of contrast and compare those two things and make sure it's working. So the next example would be dungeon layouts. So dungeon layouts is, uh, I mean, obviously a huge part of World of Warcraft, right? We have dungeons with every expansion, shipping game, shipped with a ton of dungeons. Um, this is probably the place that we use Illustrator the most is to make these layouts. Um, the one you're looking at here is, I believe, this is Halls of Origination, which is a dungeon that shipped with Cataclysm. So you can kind of see a lot of the examples in this map of what we do with things like callouts. We're trying to use color coding so that it looks really pretty. There's, there's some shaders on those pyramids there just to kind of help sell the idea you're looking at it from a top-down view. It's all really small things. It's not anything you would need to go to an art school to learn how to do. Um, but it's things like that that make it not look like a clown drawing. You know, you don't want to use different colors for different rooms and things like that. You want to try to have things look uniform across the board. Uh, this example is actually, I believe, Utgard Keep. Uh, this was a dungeon that shipped with Wrath of the Lich King. Um, you can see the same idea here. There's mark markers, there's callouts. We use a ton of text. Um, the main idea being that these maps aren't just for us to look at. These are going to go up. Uh, they're going to be talked about at meetings. They're going to be up on the boards. Um, someone's going to print them out, maybe put them in the wall of the office so when the artists are walking by, they can take a look at stuff. So you want things to be in a form that's easy to read, you know, and just presentable in general. I think I have one more here. This is a really old one. Uh, this is a layout for Encourage, uh, which actually was in the second patch that we originally shipped for World of Warcraft. So this is circa 2005, I think is when we did this. Um, so you can see the same concept here. It's just, you know, seeing things that are called out. We use this to place where the bosses go. We decide where players are going to find individual pools. So when you play WoW, there's, there's creatures, obviously, in the dungeons. We can lay those out on here. We choose not to put that in these maps, generally, because it's just too much detail. A lot of times, um, in a game like WoW, that's going to end up, we have a whole team called the Encounter Designers. And they basically are going to go in, and they're going to spawn the creatures that go within the dungeons. So on the map, it makes sense to say, where are the bosses? You know, let's build this boss room so that it fits. But things like individual creatures um, that are just trash in the dungeon, they don't make sense, so we just leave them out. It's probably just a waste of time to actually put them in this. Let's see. Oh, graveyard revamp. So this is a really, really cool example. I'm excited for you guys to see this. Um, this is uh, something that we... I thought about the number of ways you would do this without using a tool or out without thinking about the kind of macro overview of it. And it seems like it's something that would have really taken a lot of time. So in WoW, we have graveyards all throughout the world. We have literally hundreds of graveyards in the game. When you die in World of Warcraft, you go to a graveyard and then you end up having to come back as a spirit. But you, your spirit spawns at the graveyard and then you go back to your corpse and you, you res. Um, so what you're seeing here is a map of the world that's done to scale using our map stitch tool. Um, and then graveyards are laid out on there using these, these gray dots. Um, and then taking those two things together, we decided that we wanted to add more graveyards to WoW at a certain point. This is a, this is a patch that happened during the Northrend cycle. So Wrath of the Lich King had came out, and this was the first patch, I believe, patch 3.1, that we decided to do this. So here, you can see all the new graveyards uh, laid out on the map in green. And that scale reference that you see, like that little circle, that's a reference to the amount of running time it takes a player to run a minute and 30 seconds. So what we did is in game, we took a player, let him run, and then we measured that distance. I took that distance, transferred it into an Illustrator scale, made basically that radius, and then overlay that over the game world. So now I can see where all the new graveyards are. Now, here it is overlaid together, and I can see my coverage. So there, all those gray dots are the old graveyards. All the green dots are the new graveyards. And every circle lets you know that a player, if he dies, is always going to have, in general, a run time of about a minute and 30 seconds to get back to their corpse, no matter where they die. Um, so if you think about WoW and the scope of the game, doing this, uh, asking like QA to go in and, and say, hey, guys, can you just die everywhere? 
and run and kind of tell us like how, what are the bad ones. It's a huge waste of time. I mean, you could do it that way, uh, but it would take so much time. This way I was able to do all this just on my own on the computer using the tool set um, and get this data presented. And then we go in and we just surgically add the graveyards in the right place, right where we need them. So I think it's a really cool example to see how that can actually work. So here's just a look at the scale and a little bit more zoomed up where you can see the graveyard runs between uh, the two different types of graveyards. <coughs> scale. So as you saw, scale is a super huge important part of the whole process. So here's a, an interesting look at, uh, for those of you that play WoW, on the left there is Azeroth as it, as it shipped, Eastern Kingdoms and Kalimdor. And then on the top right there, well, maybe top, it's top right for you too. On the top right there, there's Northrend. Um, and then below that is Outland. Um, and all of these are to exact scale, um, using the map stitch tool and putting things in that same scale. Um, here's another example of this, and this is with Cataclysm. So with Cataclysm, it was our first expansion where none of the zones were together. So instead of making a whole new continent of stuff, we were always able to look at that continent as one whole piece and save oh, well, that's how big it was, right, in comparison to Northrend or in comparison to Outland. Um, we didn't have that opportunity to do that with Cataclysm since we were putting stuff in the old world. Um, so here you can see that's, that's the example here of looking at the different zones, looking at the scale and saying, are we biting off enough? Is this enough to justify an expansion for WoW? Is this um, an amount of work that we think we can do in about two years to get this expansion done? Um, and we're able to do all that on paper and commit to all of that way before we ever get to the point of an artist actually going into production on something. Another example here just of a grid overlay. Um, this is the... This is the Lost Isles, so this is uh, the Goblins' second area they go to after they finish Kazan. Um, same deal here, trying to get the grid in early to make sure what we're doing is filling up the amount of space that we think it's going to. Uh, so an example of that here was doing the research for where are those zones going to go in the old world. So when we shipped Cataclysm, we knew we wanted to take the existing world and really spice it up and add new stuff to it, but we didn't know if we had the room um, inside of what we had already built. Um, so here you're looking at that same scale map overlaid, um, and now the red on this map shows all the empty space in the world. Um, so everything else is a zone that's filled up, but all those red spaces we knew we could actually build new zones there. So you can actually see on Kalimdor at the bottom that giant red space, that's where we put Old Doom, because there was all that empty area there and it just made sense. Same thing with Twilight Highlands over in Eastern Kingdoms on the the eastern side of Loch Modan, there's a big red space there. So we were like, that's a great spot to put a zone. Um, so this is how we decided kind of where the zones were going to go. Obviously, they had to fit the story and the lore. Um, but by doing this up front, we just we knew it was going to work. So here's a look at that with the map stitch underneath it. So this is that same layout, uh, just with like a 50% transparency layer. And you can see the world underneath just to confirm that what you're doing is actually accurate. So again, something like this definitely takes time. Um, it's something that has to be scheduled. It's not something that someone can just kind of do in their side time and say, oh, I'm going to think about doing this. It's something that should be scheduled into your game as a whole. Take the time to think ahead and look at how long things like this are going to take. Um, give the person doing this the time to do it without feeling like they have to be rushed. Because um, in the long run, it's really going to save you time. And uh, an example here, it's kind of cool. The materials that we used for this were the same things that I used to do the graveyard revamp. So when I did the graveyard revamp, I already had to go through and render out the whole world in the map stitcher and make a, a scale illustrator layout that matched. No one had ever made an illustrator layout for all of WoW, so that took a large period of time alone. But once we had it, was able to reuse it for Cataclysm and, and use those same assets again. So that's another great part about doing that. Um, so here's another example. Uh, this is a zone flow. So when we uh, were working on Cataclysm, we had to reflow all the zones in the game. So it wasn't just uh, saying that we're going to add a couple new zones here and there. We were revamping the whole 1 to 60 experience, and that meant that the level ranges didn't fit anymore. Um, so it's an example of data uh, that can be presented in a visual way that's much easier for people to get. So you could imagine that you could do something like this in Excel. You could just have an Excel table. You could list out all 37 WoW zones. You could have a couple cells on the right that said, this is their old level range, this is their new level range. That's really simple to do. No one wants to look at that. 
it's, it's super unappealing. When you put it on the wiki, you throw it in an email, people are just like, that's another spreadsheet. Um, when you do something like this, where you, you know, you've got the actual art, um, we're using color coding to show, um, like what we did on WoW, we had green, yellow, and red zones to kind of designate how much work we were gonna put into revamping that zone. Um, and the arrows show the flow as the, the players are playing through those individual areas. So in this case, we actually used, a, we had a, Brady had made like this, this guide of the map of all of WoW. And we actually just ended up using what they had done from that map. We took it into to our stuff, put it into scale with the real world WoW stuff, and then that's what we used for this. So we ended up not even having to draw all the artwork in the back. It was a big win. Something like this we updated probably, man, 50 times. I mean, reflowing things and changing where things go. Uh, but that's what was so great about having it in a visual way like this. It was so easy to just, you know, draw the arrow going the other way, change the level range here really quick. And this was another thing that was on the wiki. Everyone had access to it. They could always see when things are changing. So uh, the, when the quest guys were working on something, if something changed, they always knew. Um, so swapping out of WoW, I decided to put in some of the stuff I did while I was at Insomniac. Um, so this is a layout for Ratchet and Clank uh, 2. This is, uh, this is level 17. I don't even remember the name of it at this point. Uh, but it's an, another example of what you can do with Illustrator. So clearly things were way more detailed. On a map like this, um, there's tons of callouts. Every individual encounter and fight that happened, we marked on the maps for Ratchet and Clank. Um, we were very meticulous about the amount of space between individual fights. I mean, we marked cover, we marked uh, the patrol paths for every individual guy, um, and then we excruciatingly went over these maps many, many, many times before we committed the art time to get these levels built. Um, and that was really the secret to what made Ratchet and Clank so successful. We paid tons of attention up front, did all the work in 2D before anything ever got to the artists. Um, Ratchet 2, 3, and 4 were all shipped in a year schedule. So each game was scheduled for just about 10 months. Um, and then the rest of that time was the, the QA time to get the game out. So we were on a super quick timeline for Ratchet. So we knew we couldn't mess up. Um, so you really had to take that time up front. You just didn't have a choice. Um, but I learned so much there, working there. Um, we worked close with Mark Cerny while we were there and a couple other guys just uh, really trying to refine our 2D process for how we did this stuff. Um, I think I've got a zoom up here. Yeah, I have a little bit more detail. So you can kind of see um, like the red dots are one type of enemy, the green dots are another one. Um, there's arrows, call outs, you know, just kind of explaining how everything works. Any of the little individual dotted lines are showing the paths that that creature would walk on. Um, so a lot of detail went into these beforehand. I think I have one other map here. Yeah, and then this is a look at that same map using scale reference. Um, and the scale reference was important at Insomniac, just like it is at Blizzard. Um, the tool we used at Insomniac was Maya. The artist used Maya to do everything. Um, and so what you're looking at here is a wireframe render from a top-down view in Maya of the level overlaid over my layout that I had made. Um, so I had the layout, handed it off to the artist. We work really close together during that you know, two-month period or so that they have to build the level. Um, and I constantly compare and contrast the scale that he or she is building at with what is in my layout and try to make sure that it fits exactly. So it's just an example of that happening. So you can do that no matter what tool you have. You might not have a map stitcher tool or whatever, but you can render a top view out of Max, you know, grab a, a screenshot of that and pull it right into whatever tool you're working in and make sure that it fits. Here's another example. Um, this is a layout from Ratchet and Clank 3. This was level six. Um, this is an outdoor level, so a completely different look, different vibe. Um, same exact concept here, though. Um, just tons of detail, lots of call-outs. Um, you can follow the way that the gameplay is playing through the whole thing. You can easily see what Ratchet's supposed to do, where he's going to go. Um, everything's kind of there. Um, these maps are so easy to hand off to someone else and have them uh, look at it, give you feedback. What we actually did in Insomniac is they had bought a plotter for us, like one of those huge, like these HP plotter thing, it was giant. And we could print maps that were, I believe, 36 inches by 72. So they were giant. Um, and then we would go into like the meeting rooms and lay these maps down on the floor and just go crazy on them. We would just draw all over them with pens and markers and kind of re relay out where things were going. Um, and we actually continue to do that at Blizzard. We have a plotter that we use. And uh, we actually do the exact same thing with layout maps. It's something that 
I thought was super important to get your hands in there and get other people, get their eyes on it. So never underestimate you know, the power of just being able to take what you've done, print it out, show it to people, let them edit it. Um, things like that are huge because it's all going to come back to you. But yeah, the biggest thing here is that the amount of detail really depends on what you want. So, you know, some people, some games need a lot of detail. Um, some games don't de need as much. Like for Ratchet, we needed all this detail in the maps. Um, on WoW, we don't have as much detail because our encounter team works kind of dynamically as far as setting up the individual fights and encounters. Um, so that covers layouts. So now we're going to move on to flowcharts. Uh, this is another tool we use uh, a ton at Blizzard. Um, we use Visio specifically, but there's a ton of flowchart programs out there that you could use. Um, flowcharts, super easy to understand. I mean, it's boxes connected by lines in most cases with some color coding. Um, tool set, you can really teach anyone how to use um, a flowcharting program. Uh, super visual, great way to see data that you don't have to look at in a spreadsheet. Once again, if you have any way to present the data not in a spreadsheet, try, because people you're just going to lose people so quickly with spreadsheets. Um, so here's an example. Uh, this is the Cataclysm Dungeon Plan. Uh, so this was a look at, we knew how many dungeons we wanted in Cataclysm, um, where were they going to go, what are the level ranges, um, and how does it all fit together. So once we had decided everything we wanted, uh, we had had a lot of jam sessions, a lot of brainstorming. Um, I went together and uh, met up with one other guy and we put this together um, and then we sent this out to the team super early on. So you know, it's real quick to just take a look at it and say, okay, uh, Obviously, the zones are listed, and then all the dungeons are in gray. Uh, I've got some color coding in here, so the things that are in blue are raids. Um, the ones that are outlined in red, those are our classic dungeons that we revamped to be heroic-only dungeons. Um, so, uh, you know, I just threw this in an email, put the key. I have a key. I didn't put it in the screenshot, but there's a key on it. Um, and send it out, and you get tons of feedback super quick. It's really easy for someone to look at it and say, eh. I don't know, that, that doesn't look like enough content, or that looks like too much, or why do we have two dungeons in Old Doom, but there's only one in Deep Palm? Like, why did we do that? Um, so much easier to present the data like this than a bullet pointed list or something like that. It's so worth it to take a program and put it together like this so it can be visual. Um, it just, you know, it's simple. That's the other thing. It's not like this takes a lot of time for you to do. You know, you should be able to do this pretty quick. And this works for anything. Obviously, it doesn't work just for like a zone flow or a layout, but you can use it for lots of other things. Um, here's the content flow that we did for Wrath of the Lich King. Um, so a little bit more detailed. Um, what you're seeing here is all the zones, uh, all the dungeons, all the raids. Um, there's even like, I think we put the patches that we wanted to have in here. Um, so this one's a little bit more detailed, but it's, uh, it's holding more data um, compared to the one I just showed you from Cataclysm. But uh, even the data that's presented here has kind of tried to be laid out in a way that makes sense. So if you played um, Northrend or uh, Wrath of the Lich King, you know the way the zones are laid out. So the way that the boxes are plotted here, they kind of try to make sense how we have Borean Tundra like on the west side and Howling Fjord on the east side. And it, it's a small thing, but when someone looks at the data, they just get it right away. They think, oh, okay, that makes sense. I know what I'm looking at. There's different shapes for different data. Um, that really helps people understand what they're looking at. Um, so here you're looking at uh, a flow for the barons. So when we redid all the zones for Cataclysm, uh, we had to reflow all the, all the quests, obviously. Um, so the team that uses flow charting the most would definitely be our quest design team. Um, and what they do, we actually don't touch anything in game. Absolutely nothing is started until the quest flow is done and approved first. And what you're looking at is the quest flow for the barons. Um, and so you can see this is heavily color coded. So the colors that you see on those boxes are the different types of quests. So collect quest, a kill a boss quest, um, what we call a ground spawn quest, where we would go tell you to like, you know, pick something out of the ground. Um, all those individual quest types are represented here. Um, there's icons, obviously, to show alliance and horde quests. And it's all grouped. So the idea being that if you're looking at this, you can say, oh, OK, I see I'm going to go into this area. And then I'm going to do a couple collect quests here, but not too many. So then let's move some down to this other area. So it's a way to plot out you know, what, everything that you're going to be doing and get it ready early, take a look at it. Um, people can comment on it. And then in the end, you have so much less rework, because you're going to get all that feedback now. Rather than having someone play through the zone and say, man, what, what's the deal? Why were there four collect quests? 
back to back. That felt really crappy. Instead, they could see that here on paper beforehand, before anyone spent that time. And that's the whole key to this whole concept. I think I have one other one here. So here's another one. This is Desilus Quest Flow. Um, the thing to note here, this one is definitely really presentable. So the reason I did this is to show you a presentable and a non-presentable one. This is something that could go on the wiki, someone could look at. There's a big key. That whole top right section is the key that explains to you what's going on. Um, definitely one that's meant to be shared. Um, this is one that should not be shared. Um, this is one that one of our other designers did that it was not intended to go on the wiki, but it was for him to keep all his information in order so he knew what he was doing. Um, this thing is loaded with content, has tons of info in it about his quest, exactly what he's going to do. But it's not something that you would want to throw in front of the team and say, this is my plan because no one's going to be able to understand it, read it, the arrows aren't very big, nothing's grouped, there's no key that lets me know what any of the colors mean. Um, so it can be great for you to keep track of your own stuff, but definitely if you're going to share it, you want it to be presentable. This is another example that this can be used not just for uh, in-game content, but you can use it for how things work. This is the pipeline of how things work on the WoW team for the, uh, the dungeons. So from going from how something would start as a 2D layout map, gets sent off to be blocked out by an artist from the artist that ends up going to our encounter designers who then put in the content. So you can kind of see that whole flow. Another example here is Wintergrasp. So Wintergrasp was the PvP zone that shipped with Wrath of the Lich King. Um, the gameplay there, a lot of people felt like they didn't know what the heck was going on um, when they got there. So internally, we saw this feedback during the beta and uh, we decided to make a quick flowchart of how the game actually played. Um, and that's what you're looking at here. So you're seeing attackers and defenders. Um, it's a vertical flowchart, so everything's flowing from top to bottom about what you would be doing. Um, but it made it so much easier for us to look at it and say, okay, maybe this is a little too complicated. Maybe we shouldn't have all of this here because um, it's going to be hard for people to figure out how this is actually working. Um, it, was a, it was a great way for us to see that stuff early on and get it figured out. So that's flowcharts. So the next thing I have to talk about is mind maps. Um, ton of different tools that you can use for this. Um, I think we use one called Mind Manager, I think. Um, but mind mapping is the concept of being able to take uh, ideas and present them visually. Whereas on a flowchart, you're working basically with boxes and arrows to move things across. Um, a mind map is more of like a brainstormed idea in the center and then all these ideas around it and how they interconnect. And it's something we use um, on the WOW team specifically to kind of figure out how is something going to work? What if we change this one thing and we move it around? What's it going to do? Um, it's really simple for people to look at them and view them too. Um, as you can see, that, that's definitely a big trend that we have is trying to make sure that people can visually read anything. Um, so this is a really complicated one to start with. Um, this is, like I said, this is the Wintergrass design. So this is what Wintergrass kicked off with, um, and clearly way too complicated. Um, I had to make this just for me to keep my head wrapped around what I had even designed for the actual zone. Um, but it was a great way to track that info. All of these things are, uh, you can collapse them and open them real easy. Um, so it's easy to focus in on one individual section of what you're doing. Um, certainly not presentable, not something you would want to go say, hey, what do you think of this? You couldn't even explain this to someone like over lunch, like it's so, you know. Um, but it's a great way for, for a person to keep all that info for themselves, like a designer that's trying to look at this and figure out how am I going to work with all these different sections, there's so many different things to this. Um, you can try to break down individual parts and not get boggled. Um, so this is just more of a close up looking in at an individual area where I've closed all the other uh, branches and I'm only looking at one individual branch. So you can do that. Um, so this is the guild advancement design. So this was a new feature that we shipped with Cataclysm. Um, this was a, a really complicated one to work on. Had to take so many different sections of the game and try to get them all in ways that made sense to everyone. Because most people that play WoW are in a guild. And so we wanted things in the guild that appealed to everyone, to our raiders, our solo players, players that use the Looking for Dungeon tool. Um, so using something like this was a great way to get that macro view of the whole system, figure out how it was going to work and what was going on um, without having to get lost in all of the individual details. Um, this isn't set up in a way that um, could be shared either. This is another thing that's just great for you to use individually, um, but really helps. 
You can also take, uh, this is a screenshot of a part of the system that was in progress from our UI guys. And I was able to take that and input that into the individual map. So like when I wanted to look at this section, I would have an idea of already what's going on there. I could see the progress and it definitely helps. You could put notes in, you can take screenshots of what you're working on. Um, and putting those in your notes is indispensable because it's stuff that you can look back to really quick and easily and not get lost in it. Um, this is another example of using it for tracking. So during uh, the Burning Crusade, we were tracking our level design group and trying to see if they were going to be able to finish everything within a certain time frame and we could do an extra zone or maybe we should split our group into two separate pipelines and work on different things. So you can see here, uh, there's a list of all the zones. There's locks on them, which mean that they're locked out. I'm using icons a ton in this. There's names assigned to individual things for people. Um, there's color-coded priorities of like one, two, three. You can see on Zillamon down there in the bottom right. Um, and this is just a way to keep track of everything and know what's going on. In general, hopefully you would have producers that can help you with this stuff, but um, it's also something I think is really important that you know how to do. It's not something you don't ever want to rely on someone else to be able to just kind of handle everything. It's really nice if you can know how this is working, like who's assigned to what. If you're waiting on an asset, why is it taking so long? Can I find out what the timeline is on that? Um, and using a mind map like this was a great way to be able to do that just made it really simple to track that progress and see what was going on. Um, so the final one is spreadsheets. Uh, save the most exciting one for last. Um, spreadsheets, like I said, is something, they are immensely valuable for certain things, um, but not very presentable. Um, but it's definitely a big way that macro design influences what we do on WOW. So we've got a couple examples here for you. Um, this first one is enchanting um, the actual profession. And so, Wow is all numbers, everything that we work on, right, internally, the items, the level of items, the power, um, the, the abilities, the stats, everything ends up being numbers. Um, so what we've done here is basically take that and applied some formatting to it so it's easier to read. Um, so those green and yellow dots that you're seeing, like the box is colored, that's letting the designer know, looking at this, that when someone goes to make that item, their chance of getting a skill up. So inside of WOW, if an item's green, you've got like a 25% chance to get a skill up. If it's yellow, um, you've got a 50% or higher chance. And so by setting this up, he can individually change the numbers and the boxes, and the color is going to change to let you know um, if that skill up ratio is going to work correctly. Um, and finding this kind of data in the game would be extremely difficult. Um, to go into the game yourself and try to cheat, even with us having cheats working at Blizzard and being able to cheat all the items and looking at it, you still have to spend all that time to make the item, check if it's green or blue, find out, where if you just put all the numbers into a spreadsheet and spend a little time up front, check it out, you're going to use this for the rest of the whole game. You know, the spreadsheet was used for three years to make sure that things worked and that the flow uh, went together in the right way. So in certain cases, uh, using something like Excel can be, can be really great. You just don't want to rely on it. Um, so another example here is the gems. Um, so we ended up redoing all the gems for Cataclysm. We introduced new types of gems and we introduced new um, bonuses on those gems. What you're looking at here is a matrix chart of the gems. Um, so across the top is one of the bonuses that you would get. And on the left side is the other bonus. Those are the stats that are on the gem. Um, and then across the middle and all those colors in the, on the inside, that's the color of the gem in the game and then the individual name. And so by having a spreadsheet like this, we can see um, it looks like our coverage on blue gems is a little low, right? There's only four blue gems total, where if you look at how many green gems there are, there's way more. Um, same thing, it looks like we're a little low on red gems. So by putting it into a spreadsheet like this, you can visually see the data. And uh, I mean, especially for a designer to look at something like this, we're such visual people to begin with. Um, just being able to look at something pretty quickly like this, you can get an idea of what's going to happen up front and uh, how that's going to play out in the game without someone having to take all the time, make all these items in our internal tool, send it to QA, and then ask QA, can you, you, know, can you run through this and send us feedback? Which you're going to end up doing at some point to get feedback, but doing this up front really makes you feel so much more confident in your idea and that you got it right. Um, and it takes a little bit of time, obviously, you'd have to know, but using Excel isn't too crazy. I mean, con things like conditional formatting are used here, where basically we say um, if there's a certain value in this box, it turns a certain color. Um, but other than that, I mean, there's no like crazy formulas or anything like that. This is all something that can be done pretty easily. 
Um, this final one is uh, the Dungeon Finder level ranges. So we introduced the Dungeon Finder, um, and that is a tool. If anyone hasn't used it, it's a tool inside of World of Warcraft where you can queue up for a dungeon, and we automatically find people for you to play with. Um, but there's individual level ranges for each dungeon, and those level ranges change based on which expansion you own. So if you own Original WoW, or you have the Burning Crusade, or Lich King, or Cataclysm, those numbers change because certain dungeons might not be available to you because you don't own that expansion pack. Um, so what this is is a list of the dungeons, um, the individual uh, values, and then each expansion listed at the top, and kind of going over what level ranges are there. So you can super quick look at this and say, okay, clearly there's a gap. There's no dungeon, like let's say for level 22 to 24. We've got to fix that. So then we'll adjust those dungeon ranges. Um, so this was a piece of data that was up on the wiki really early. All of our QA team had access to it. And you know, we constantly changed it. We looked at it and said, let's move a couple things around. Let's figure out ways that this would work the best way. Um, and something like Excel, it's just super easy. It's easy to do, quick to, to change that data. So it just makes sense to do it up front. So wikis, I've been talking about wikis quite a bit over this whole thing. Um, the concept of how we use wikis on WOW is that we try to get as much data as humanly possible on the wiki. Um, we actually have uh, a whole person uh, that her whole job is just to populate the wiki with stuff that we're doing. So when I was working on the guild advancement system for WOW, um, for example, she took all my original design docs on it, converted them to the wiki, um, went into the game, took screenshots, took those screenshots, put them on the wiki. Because, you know, we, we we're a big team. We're like 150 people on the WOW team. Um, and a lot of the artists want to know what's the guild system we're working on. I heard we're making this new system, but they don't know. So this info can be on the wiki so they can get a look at it and see, you know, how it works. We can share that information. Because one of those artists might be the, be the guy that was assigned to make me one of the items that I need for the guild system. And it's really great that that person can feel invested in what they're doing because they know what the system is. Um, they've read all about it. So this is just a look at, um, I believe this is the cataclysm flow for the wiki. So she, the Visio chart is captured. And then on the right, there's like a ton of links to all the different stuff. Down in the bottom right, that's a look at all the zone revamps. So the blue were the new zones that we were doing for cataclysm. And then the red, green, and yellow are all the zone revamps and the extent of that revamp, like how much work was going to go into each individual revamp. Uh, this is just another screenshot of some more data, just looking at like, this is Zolomon. So when, when the encounter guys go to work on the individual uh, zones, they'll actually list out all the abilities, all the things that those guys are going to do, and put it all on the wiki. So then when uh, a dungeon gets sent to QA, and QA has to test it and look at it, they can refer to the wiki and know exactly what the designer was intending for that individual encounter. Layouts, the exact same thing. So this was the Zolomon layout. Um, this is the top-down view of it. Um, so we wanted to get this up so people could see what they were, you know. We're working on Zolomon for the patch, so you want everyone to have an idea of what the area is, what it's going to look like. And getting this kind of stuff on the wiki early is just the kind of thing that can help that work so much better. And I think a wiki is open source type thing, so it's something that anyone could be able to use. Um, we have servers that run it at work, but it's open source. Um, so to recap over the everything we've been kind of talking about here, the, the key element is that you can kind of keep the whole picture in view. You don't ever want to have a part of your game that's out of view. It's something that gets left off or that you're not thinking about. Or you say, well, we're going to deal with that uh, when we get there. We're going to work on the first 10 levels and then the bonus levels. Uh, we'll just we'll deal with those later. You want to know how big are the bonus levels? How many are you going to have? What are the layouts? How is it going to work? You need to think about all that and make sure it's all together and it's in your original idea and that it's documented. Use the right tools is super important. I mean, I've gone over a few tools that we use, things like Illustrator, Visio, um, but there's there's tons of tools out there that can do all the same sorts of things. There's free versions of lots of these tools that people can use. You don't have to pay the, the, I don't know, 200 bucks for Illustrator, you can get uh, vector layout programs that, that can do a lot of the things Illustrator can do. It's not the tool you're using necessarily, it's more of you taking the initiative to use the tool and use it in the right way. Um, make it presentable. Um, you definitely want to think about this and make sure it's something that is in your mind. When you're trying to sell an idea, you know, it's just so much easier to present something that people are going to like. It's visually 
easy to look at. It doesn't, you know, it looks like you spent some time on it. I think that's the best way. If you can look at it and say, this is something that you feel proud of, you think it's something that someone else would be able to get pretty quick, then it's probably good enough. But if you know you rushed it and you just did it quick enough, like you were jotting it down on paper, that's not really going to fly. That's not the way that you're going to go into a meeting and sell your grand vision for what this section of the game is, what this system might be, or what this level might be. Um, it's something that is often overlooked by designers, and it's, it's actually something I think that's super important that you that really need to think about. Um, and finally, just do you know, only as much detail as you need. Um, there's no reason to go crazy on things and be spending tons of time on something that no one's going to actually use all that detail. If you need it, definitely do it. Um, if you don't need it, then don't. I mean, you're just wasting your time on things that people aren't really going to care about. Um, and finally, it's totally worth it. I mean, it's worked. We've been working on WoW now. Uh, gosh, it was they were working on WoW for four years before I even got there um, when WoW shipped. But I mean, we've been using all of these practices on World of Warcraft, um, and it's helped us be able to ship our expansions in the time frame that we want to keep the scale of the game relevant, to make sure we're delivering content to players that makes sense. Um, things like this worked great for us at Insomniac. We use these kind of tools um, to make sure that the things we were doing were going to work. You don't want to have to go back and redo things because you didn't spend that time up front. So it's definitely something that's worth it. And that's what I have for you today. Thank you. Uh, in a year-long project, uh, how much time would you allocate to all this pre-planning when you require as much detail as you did for, say, let's say, Ratchet and Clank? For like an individual level? Uh, not necessarily individual. Or for the game as a whole. Yeah. I mean, we would start pre-planning before the next game shipped. Like for example, on Ratchet 2, we were already working on probably two zones for Ratchet 3. Two levels, zones. <laughs> we were probably already working on two levels at that point. Um, so the amount of time that we were spending, I think we had individually probably six weeks for a designer to design one of those maps from beginning to end um, and have it at the point where we would say this is deliverable to an artist okay. at that point. And that would include tons of brainstorming meetings, like you know, like meeting with the other everything. designers and talking about does this make sense, meeting with our lead and saying, did, you know, is this something we want to we want to do? If it is, refine it a little bit and bring it back. But that was generally the time frame. Okay, so to the point where like everything's everyone's willing to sign off on it. That's much? basically the deal. You want to get to the point where when you hand it off to the artist to build, um, that you feel super confident in it, right? Like you don't want to get to a point where, especially these days, the art that's being done for video games now is insane compared to the art when I got in. You know, 14 years ago it was things were still boxes and it's the stuff it's like iPhone blows away what we were doing back then, right? Mm -hmm. So there's just so much time that goes into that aspect of the game. It's worth it, you know, to, like you said, just to think about it early. Cool. Thank you. Now, before we talk about having like blank zones where you can like sort of incorporate new areas with every new expansion, but the amount of empty space you have is only so limited. It's going to run out sooner or later. So how do you plan for running out of space and possibly expanding when you run out of the space you started with? It was definitely a unique situation. I have no idea where this question is coming from. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hi. okay, good. That's what better. Um, it was a unique situation. Um, we were dealing with the fact that we knew kind of how much space we needed to make because we had shipped the two expansions prior, right? So we kind of thought, well, this is how much we're going to need to do this individual thing. Um, but it ended up that we didn't have to. We ended up having so much space that wasn't used. Like there's still a ton of space in the original game right now that's not being used. Um, so, you know, if it would have came to that, we we wouldn't have really cut into any existing zones. We would have just added terrain outside of the existing zones. So, like if we wanted to add a zone that was at the edge, we would have just pulled up the terrain from the seafloor and said that oh, the cataclysm caused this new terrain to come up, and then we would have <laughs> built a new zone on it. I mean, we obviously follow the story as close as we can um, at Blizzard. It's super important that the lore and things make sense. Um, but the design and the fun of the game has to be first and foremost you know, before that. So if we have an idea that we think is going to be cool, we'll figure out a way to make sure that the lore fits with it. Thank you. OK, so 
obviously with the cataclysm expansion you've uh, you know tightened the level progression to make everything sort of gel a little bit better so that it's a you know more consistently fun experience as um, there any sort of like challenge with keeping it balanced between all the different character classes because there's like how many character classes in WoW? There's like 10 of them there's or 10. something. Yeah. There's 10. Yeah. It's super hard. It's I, definitely hard. Um, I'll bet. I think the, the biggest thing about that is that the different classes play different ways. So like you have casters, you have melee, um, you've got tanks, you've got people that want to heal. Um, that was part of where when we were looking at the revamp, it wasn't necessarily the level flow. It was making sure that the quest content that was in those individual levels made sense for all the different class types. Um, so you want to make sure that you had quests that were fun for everything. Um, the levels kind of came together where we wanted you to spend less time in one individual area. We didn't want people having to spend, you know, 20 levels in the barrens because it gets boring looking at the same thing for that long, right? So we want more wanted people to spend about five levels in each individual area. Um, and so that's what you were seeing on that layout, was kind of trying to redistribute where people could go through the world. Um, and then it came down to the quest guys, making sure that those individual quests were fun for all the different classes. When it comes to designing new features and new systems for WoW, the sheer amount of information posted on the screen there, how much of the design is compromised by just fact-checking all, all that's come before in order to add something that's new and individual? A lot. I mean, a, a ton of that. Like, so for example, would be adding on to like a profession uh, is a good example. Um, it's something we've wanted to do for a long time would be revamp the fishing in WoW. It's a great example. Fishing's been in there forever. We've talked about it at BlizzCon many times that we would love to revamp fishing. You would think it wouldn't be that hard because fishing's pretty simple in WoW, but it turns out that that exact question, it's, an, it's a nightmare because fishing exists throughout WoW everywhere. It's all, so all the water planes that you can fish in are all individually tagged by hand with individual level ranges for what fish you're going to pull out of it. Um, there's treasure tables attached to that that tell you all this stuff. Um, so in order to change fishing, you're looking at really taking one designer down for over a year. Um, and so this is when those kind of decisions come into play. We say, would we rather, is that worth it in the long run of WoW? Do enough people fish to spend that time? Or is it better to have that guy work on, say, something else like uh, archaeology, a completely new profession where we don't have to go into anything existing and mess with it and tackle something else? That's one of the things that gets harder with WoW every time we release an expansion. The game gets bigger, and there's so much maintenance. You know, e Every time you have to up the talent trees, you have to add all the professions have to go up by 75 points. Um, so you know, it continually grows. So that's a big, big thing is that we don't want to get on that slippery slope where just because it's a new expansion, it doesn't mean everything is going to be, there's always going to be new features. There might be an expansion, you know, one day where what things that people are accustomed to, we're not doing. Just because, it, you know, at a certain point, we can only add so much. But yeah, that's a great question. It's something that always comes up. The amount of maintenance we have to do on an old thing to keep it moving and feeling fresh. My particular question, you mentioned the, uh, the uh, I guess the level design. Um, yeah. How many times it was um, more the level design influencing the lore, or the lore influencing the level design? I mean, I would like to say that it's 50-50. Um, initially, everything starts with the lore on WoW. Um, Cataclysm is a great example, right? Like, um, if you look at a zone like Hygel, which was one of those first zones, Hygel has been in WoW lore for so long. Um, the world tree is at the top, obviously. We can't have a level designer just saying, well, let's just not have a world tree. Like, that just doesn't work, right? Um, but there were a lot of things that did come, come into that. So the whole idea in Hygel is that Ragnaros has come through and he's attacking the whole bottom of the, of, the, of the zone. That was something that wasn't in the lore at all, but it was something that one of the level designers thought would be a really cool way to mix up the look of the zone. So he pitches that like, uh, we kind of have Chris Metzen is our guy that oversees all our lore, like on WoW at Blizzard. Um, so we meet with Chris and talk about the ideas, and those ideas get pitched. And it's it's just a, it's a matter of, can we make that work? Is it going to add a ton of time? Does it feel cool? Um, but I would say it's probably like 60-40. You know, a, a lot really does come from the level guys. They'll say, let's add a lake here, and let's do like a whole bunch of unique quests around it. So a level designer will go grab one of the quest designers and, you know, discuss this idea a little bit, and then if it's sold at the point where we're happy with it, then we're going to go ahead and move forward. There's definitely a lot of back and forth, though. It's not like we don't, 
We don't like to just hand a map to someone like you saw these layout maps and just say, well, just build this. Like you're, you're an artist, just build it. We don't want it to work on like that. You know, the artist needs to be able to have their input, come up with ideas that are cool. Like say, I want to do a, a door that breaks here, you know, and the boss runs through the door and that's way cooler than what you had on the map. But yeah, awesome, let's do it. You know, we want to have back and forth, definitely. I think this is the last one. Um, I'm kind of curious about your, um the way you handle your milestones and gates when it comes to content creation and getting approval um, with all these different zones and pieces of content and they have to be sold up as well as everyone building it. I'm curious on what gates you use, what milestones you use, and what approvals you need to go forward and get greenlit and then get it to completion. Yeah, definitely. Um, the scheduling for the way we do that stuff, typically we start with a, the, like a brainstorm session. You know, we'll, we'll sit with Chris and we'll figure out uh, what's a cool zone. Deep Home, for example, let's take Deep Home like in Cataclysm. Uh, this zone, it's really crazy. Uh, it's got a really unique pitch. Um, it'll start there, and then it goes to like a 2D layout. It's probably the first like milestone. We'll get that 2D layout and say, this is how big it's going to be. This is kind of the vibe. These are all the different creatures and races that we're going to have there. Um, from there, we do what's called like a block out, which is we have a tool called Wow Edit that we build everything in, um, which is basically uh, it's a height map. So you use a Wacom tablet, and you paint on a grid. Uh, like, you know, Maya and, and Max have tools like that, but we have that. That's how we make all the terrain in WoW. You, we paint with a Wacom, and uh, it takes the pressure, and it pull, pushes and pulls mountains. So we'll build the whole zone in a blockout phase like that, um, and then we'll get a look at it from scale. We'll get on flying mounts, fly all across it. Is it too big? Is it too small? How big? How do the POIs feel? Um, once we're happy at that point, quest designers get in, and we let the quest guys. That's probably the... Th the fourth phase would be the quest guys come in and they start setting up the quests. Um, and kind of simultaneous with that, all the art goes into production. So like say we need a bunch of buildings for this new race that's gonna be here or we need a castle or we need a keep or whatever. Um, all of that goes into production at that point with the art team. And then at that point, we're all working together. It's level design, the artists, the quest group, um, all kind of working to make see it to fruition. And then we, we have meetings once a week um, we have like a weekly exterior level design meeting and the whole group gets together and we invite the leads from all the different parts of the team so they can see what's going on and then we review it. Like you said, and then we just kind of keep going back and forth. Do we like the direction this is going? Okay, sweet, keep going. This is looking bad, just cut your losses now. Let's just cut it. And that usually happens at those weekly meetings.